title of our sermon today is You Do Not Know What You Ask. And our text is Mark 10, verses 35 to 45. And as we get into that reading, you will understand what the title is all about. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> Notice they said whatever we ask. Well, I tell you what, <laughs> they had really visions of grandeur for their prayer life, did they not? And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us that we may sit on one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many." How many of us are like James and John and ask God for whatever we want? Okay? Prayer is a blessed privilege given us by God. Amen? God is busy running the universe and watching over all the peoples on planet Earth. How can he have time to even notice our prayers. I've just thought of that over and over again. So much is going on in the universe, on planet Earth. How can God take a moment to hear me when I pray? Yet, in the midst of all this busyness, God does take time to notice us when we pray. And furthermore, He is attentive to the things that we ask. We have the tendency to mistake that for private familiarity and misuse the privilege much in the same way as James and John did on this occasion. These brothers were acting out some selfishness by dressing it up in a religious robe. You see, they were two of the first called disciples of Jesus making them somewhat special in their minds. And they mistook this fact for an implied greatness in their relation with Jesus that did not exist with the other disciples. We're really special. This sense of greatness infected other members of their family because Matthew records that it was actually their mother that approached Jesus with this request. Okay? And this shows us that there is a danger of spiritual pride affecting families in the work of the church. If you've been around in various congregations, uh, sometimes you will see this. You know, there's that one family in the church, just kind of above everybody else. It happens. It happens. The request was that Jesus should grant them to sit in a place of recognition that they wanted for themselves. 
Now, we understand this word grant to mean to give something, which it does. However, the first definition in the dictionary is to bestow or confer, especially by a formal act. What these disciples were wanting was actually more in the line of a coronation, setting them apart from the other disciples. They seemed to believe that their relationship with Jesus deserved public recognition, investing them with authority over the other disciples. They, in a sense, were asking Jesus to put the crown on their heads in front of the other disciples so that their authority would appear to come directly from him. Jesus responded, telling them they did not know what they were asking. A person's worth in the kingdom of God is not based on his position in the church, whatever it might or might not be. Personal worth in the kingdom of God is based on a person's response to the will of God for his life. Jesus suggests that in God's will for every person's part in the kingdom of God, there will be an element of sorrow and an element of suffering. Our work, excuse me, our worth in the work of God in this world is actually found in our testimony of salvation from sin and the impact that God has on others through the witness of our lives. Okay, church positions have their place and their worth. But the real work of the kingdom is done outside the church building in the everyday places of life as God's people live out the righteousness of Christ in those very places. People see you in different phases and conditions of your life, conditions that you face every day, sometimes places of sorrow, sometimes places of suffering. And you may not realize how God's grace given to you in those situations, good, bad, or indifferent, speaks to other people whose lives are facing similar things. Now, the Bible does teach us values of worth in the church. The Apostle Paul addressed these values in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. He starts by telling us in verse 12, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So Paul here likens the church to a natural physical body. A body has many different kinds of members with specific purposes that make it a functioning body. So Paul emphasizes the point that he is writing about the church saying, so also is Christ. In other words, the church being the body of Christ, has many members. Your body has a nose, has ears, has hands, fingers, on and on and on. And so does the body of Christ. It's like a physical body. It has different kinds of members that are necessary to its function as a body. Now, all the members are important. All the members are equal. And the equality of members begins with the experience of salvation from sin, as he points out to us in verse 13. He says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. The baptizing 
performed by the Holy Spirit in a person's life is the new birth of which Jesus spoke in John chapter 3, verse 3, where he says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again there, meaning what he says in verse 8. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay? Paul says we are baptized by the Spirit into the one body. That word baptism and born convey the same meaning. Okay? The new birth is not limited to certain people. It's available to all people, regardless of ethnicity or any other discriminating fact. Paul talks about Jews uh, and, and Greeks, talks about slaves and free, and you can come down and pay any kind of contrasting thing, educated and uneducated, wealthy and poor, uh, male and female, so forth like that. Okay, New birth is not limited to just a certain group of people. It's available to everyone on earth. All people born again have been made to drink into one spirit. Or as Adam Clark explains it, we are made partakers of the gifts and graces of the Holy Ghost. Something God does in us and for us. Salvation from sin is the one thing in which all people that have experienced it are equal. Thank God for that. All the people in God's church are equal because they have all been saved from sin. Paul goes on to explain in verse 14 that the body, the church, is not one member, but many. He uses examples of eyes, hearing, and smell to demonstrate that a normal body has many differing and necessary parts. Not being the same does not mean they are not equal. In fact, if all body parts were the same, there would really be no body. It would just be a big eye or a big ear or a big nose and totally useless. In verse 25, Paul points out that all the body parts are essential to the health and function of the body. He writes that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. And he goes on to show in verse 26 that body parts do not work independently. They work together for the health of the body. He says, and if one member suffers, all members suffer, suffers with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. You know, my nose is very glad that my right hand has an index finger. It really is. Because every once in a while, I get an itch on my nose, like that. And the big finger comes over to scratch it. Okay? When one member suffers, that nose, itching, gets irritated. All the members suffer with it. Because, you know, while I'm up here delivering the message and my nose is itching, you know, I, I get uncomfortable. I move around. Kind of, uh, okay? So, if one member is honored, okay, my right finger, index finger can honor my nose and scratch it. All the members rejoice with it. Oh, that feels so good. Now I can go on and deliver the rest of the sermon. You get the idea? You know, the body needs all its members because it may be not be your nose that itches. It may be some other thing about your body where other members of the bodies have to come along and help. Well, you know, among the body of Christ, whether it be just an individual congregation 
for the people of God abroad, you know, at large in the world. When there's a need, thank God the members of the body can come along and help. You know, in the church, we need to be taught, we need to be instructed in the things of God. Aren't you glad that God places members in the body that can teach? Aren't you glad? Have you ever sat in a sermon where it was obvious that the person up there really doesn't know how to teach? They don't know how to teach. And you know, your, your bench gets real hard. <laughs> your mind begins to wander. You start looking at your watch and you're saying, how long is this going to go on? And you're just waiting for it to be over. Hey, I, I have been in some of those services, my friends. So the body needs all of its members to do what they are designed to do. And Paul finally reminds us that the figure of the body and its function applies to the church of verse 27. He says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. You have worth. You are equal to all the other members. Now, certainly my index finger does not look like my thumb, but they are equal. They are necessary to the function of the body. You don't look like other members in the body of Christ, but you are equal to those members and you are important to the function of the body of Christ. As the human body would be crippled without some of its members, so would the body of Christ, the church, be crippled without all its members. So whoever you are, you are a specific member of the body of Christ with a specific purpose. You are important. And without you, the body would suffer and be less effective in some way. So I'm just a little toe. I'm not important. Tell you what, I am glad that I have a little toe on my foot. Right now, it's inside of a sock, inside of a shoe. It can't be seen, but I know it's there. And it's doing its job. Did you know that that little toe is important to your balance? <laughs> Without it, you know, the body has to compensate for it. And something else has to fill in. Friend, you are important. You may be a little toe. And you may be somebody that people just don't see. But you are important to the body of Christ. You are as important as I am, as anybody else is. And thank God for you. We would certainly miss you if you weren't there. So Paul applies the importance of the members of the body to certain functions of the church. And he lists these functions in verse 28. He writes, and God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles, the gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. These are all gifts of ministry necessary to the function of the church as it carries out the work of the kingdom of God. Now, this list might appear to start with the most important and lead down to the least important. That's kind of what it looks like, isn't it? But the truth is, all of these are equally important in the work Jesus assigned to his church. But whatever gift of ministry he may give a person does not measure his importance or make him any better than anyone else in the church. Paul asks some rhetorical questions in verses 29 and 30, asking if all people in the church are apostles or so forth. And of course the answer is no. So while those 
gifts are useful and needed, Paul tells us there is something far more important and needful that we all must have. We don't need everybody to be apostles or prophets. But there's something that we all need. He says in verse 31, And yet I show you a more excellent way. (coughs) Which leads us then into chapter 13, where he finalizes his conclusion in verse 13, and says, And now abides faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Is love. And there is where the equality resides. The love of God so fills our lives and our hearts. And that love of God flows out from us to the other members of the body of Christ. And it is in that love of God that we all enjoy, that we recognize our equality. We love those with that love of God, and we don't care if they're black or red or yellow or white, if they're male, female, old, young, Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, whatever. We love them. We love them and they love us. And we are equal. We're glad to see them when they come to church. We shake their hand. We tell them we love them. We honor them. We respect them. And we come to their aid and help when they need it because they will come to our aid and help when we need it. Now, the desire of James and John to be greatest in the kingdom did not please the other disciples. Did you notice that when we read our text? (laughs) In verse 41 of Mark chapter 10, we're told, and when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Now, the text does not say this, but it just may be that each of the other ten may have thought he was more qualified to be the greatest among them. Hmm. Touched a nerve when James and John said, we want to be the greatest. You know, Thaddeus might have thought, hey, no, look, I'm more qualified to be the greatest. James, the other James may say, hey, wait a minute. I'm qualified to be the greatest. Not you guys. I don't know, I'm just making up things there. Just thoughts that could have gone through their minds. What's important is Jesus goes on to tell them in verse 42 that the church is not like a big business corporation where there is a chain of command and levels of authority between top management and the workers. There's no chain of command. Greatness in the church is not vested in a church office, or some layer of service. It is vested in the love of God in our hearts. Jesus tells us in verse 43 what greatness in the kingdom of God is. He says, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. That's greatness. That's greatness. If we have been saved from sin, we have been added to the body of Christ. And as a member of his body, each of us have a specific function that no one else has. Each of us, regardless of our place in the body of Christ, is important. And it is the will of Jesus that each of us be great And our greatness is measured by how we serve the other members of the body. So your place is to serve others in the capacity that Jesus has given you, whatever that capacity may be. So do your best and do it out of love. James and John did not know what they asked. Do you know 
what you should ask Jesus for in your capacity in the kingdom of God? Well, let me give you a clue. Ask for what will make you a better servant to others. Ask for more of his love to be shown through your life. Amen.